40 here. So Richard Hanania was exposed over the weekend by the Huffington Post. Exposed to saying a lot of ill-advised things. Uh, own so goals, things that were you know, needlessly offensive to a great part of the population. He's offended uh, community standards. I like Richard Hanania. He's one of my probably 10 favorite uh, public intellectuals, but I don't feel bad for him. All right, this is the the bed that he, he built for himself. He, he created this. He seems to be a strong, capable person. So he created this trouble for himself. He seems to be on a good path, all right? He made an effective, I thought, apology. And I thought the article was, was fair. Okay, how about Dennis Prager saying it's evil, it's not evil to think about doing things with kids. Yes, I agree with Dennis Prager because to me, what is evil is actually doing things, not just thinking about things, all right? So actually doing things, to me, that is evil. What am I talking about? So this is a clip that a lot of people were just very eager to show me. So here evil we go. Evil only with behavior. He, uh, but would you would you use the word evil of animated child pornography? Because no, I, I certainly I, I, would. I, no, I would use evil only with behavior. That's where we might differ. Yeah. From forgetting the sex issue, you can't be evil. You didn't do evil if you thought evil. You I, did if evil I'm if I'm masturbating to animated pictures of pornography, I'm not doing something evil. That's correct. Yeah, I think that's I think that's despicable. Yeah. Really? Yes, of course. He, uh, but would you it, would you use? Okay, so th there's not much difference between uh, masturbating to anime pictures or just masturbating to pictures in your head. Pornography is simply male fantasies acted out. So if you don't hurt anyone and you have naughty fantasies, okay, everyone has thought about killing someone, all right? So is it uh, more evil to think about killing someone or to think about uh, sex with, with children? All right, so depending on uh, who you might be killing in your fantasy, uh, generally speaking, most people would consider murder more evil than interfering with a child. So I would agree with Dennis Prager. I would only apply the word evil to behavior, not to fantasies, not to your imagination, not to you know what, uh, what you crank off to at night, right? I don't think it's ideal. I think it's concerning. I think it's disturbing. I think it's repulsive. All right. I, I don't identify with it. It's completely foreign to me, but I would not describe it as evil. So, yeah, I agree. It's not evil to have thoughts. Yes. I believe that murder is more evil than sexually abusing children. Most children who are sexually abused, to the best of my understanding, go on to lead relatively normal lives. Most people who are murdered do not go on to live any life. So, yeah, I would say in, in my value system, in my hero system, committing murder is at least 10 times worse than committing child abuse. So we should probably do a show decoding trauma. So child abuse was really invented in 1962. That's the first time we start seeing the word and the term thrown around. And then child abuse just gets en endlessly and endlessly expanded so that child abuse now effectively means uh, anything that you did to hold back the flourishing of your child now gets defined as child abuse. So if you vote Republican, you're committing child abuse. If you have guns in the house, you're now committing child abuse, according to many people. If you don't you know, pay for therapy for your child, if you don't encourage them to uh, follow their gender identity in whatever direction they wish, you're committing child abuse. So let's have a look at the chat. Yeah, the thought and the act are inseparable. That's not true. Everybody thinks about murdering someone. Most people don't murder. So for every person who thinks about committing murder, only about one in 50,000 persons actually commits murder. So the thought and the act are inseparable. Yeah, that's true about 0.001% of the time. The other 99.999% of the time, it's not true. It's not even close to true. It's not even the same universe as truth. It's absolutely absurd. There is no zip, zero, zilch, factual basis for saying that the thought and the act are inseparable. Whoever acted must have had the thought. Yes. But 99.99999% of people who had the thought did not act. So the connection between the thought and the act, yeah, it occurs about 0.000001% of the time. So 99.999999% of the time, you're completely wrong. 
but point zero 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 one percent of the time you're right so for me from my perspective if your position is wrong 99.9999999999 percent of the time you hold an absurd position you are completely removed from reality you are in your own fantasy world there's absolutely no correlation between what you hold to be true and what is actually true right Everybody thinks about murdering someone, and yet only about one in 50,000 people, depending on, on the group of people, actually commits murder. So the correlation between the thought and the deed occurs about 0.0001% 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, of the time. So about 0.0001% 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, of the time, you're right. But 99.99999% of the time, you're absolutely wrong, completely wrong, absolutely no connection. So Judaism basically doesn't consider sexual perversion a sin. Yeah, you think uh, Judaism just thinks it, it's great for uh, adults to think about you know, having sinful sex? Guess what? It is a sin in Judaism to think about committing sin. It is a sin in, in Judaism to indulge in masturbation. Masturbation is a sin. Not just in Judaism, in every traditional way of life of which I'm aware, masturbation is a sin. Right? People masturbate to lustful thoughts. And in Judaism, in Christianity, I would expect in Islam, and in pretty much every traditional way of life, of which I'm aware, masturbation's a sin. Indulging in lustful thoughts is a sin, whether your lustful thoughts are about adults or children or animals or tree trunks. Right? It's a sin. So Judaism basically doesn't consider sexual perversion as a sin as long as you... No. Judaism puts a higher priority on how you act than on what you think about, right? Everybody thinks about committing murder, but Judaism considers it far more heinous to actually commit murder than to simply think about it. To be human is to occasionally think about murdering someone. I, I, I'm not sure there's ever been anyone alive who hasn't ever considered murdering someone. But there is a pretty big difference between thinking about murder and committing murder. Most people are perfectly capable of having thoughts flow through their head about committing murder and not acting on it. So how do I know that everybody thinks about committing murder? Because everybody is placed in situations where somebody's existence, very life, all right, is against their interests. Like somebody has a woman that you want. Somebody has d dangerous, damaging information on you. Somebody is holding something that you want. Somebody is humiliating you. Somebody is damaging you. Right? Everybody experiences pain and hurt and humiliation and damage and destruction at the hands of other people. And often people will feel absolutely helpless to do anything about it. And so they fantasize, what if I could get rid of the person who is torturing me? What if I could get rid of the person who is damaging me? What if I could get rid of the person who is humiliating me? What if I get, could get rid of the person who is just constantly doing me harm? What if I could get rid of the person who is threatening my family? What if I could get rid of the person who is harming my wife, my children, my community? Uh, NMA pictures of prepubescent girls. Yeah, I think that's absolutely disgusting, repellent, uh, and appalling. And uh, I would not be in favor of legalizing, you know, NMA pictures of prepubescent girls in you know in any kind of sex-related uh, context. Fantasies can and often do lead to action. Yes, 0.0001% of the time, fantasies about murdering someone actually lead to murder. But 99.9999999% of the time, fantasizing about murder does not lead to committing murder, does not even lead to kicking someone, does not even lead to punching someone, it does not lead to you doing anything concrete to actually put the person's life in danger. So... Sometimes, yeah, fantasies, 0.00001% of the time, you're under something. Don't try to pill pull your way out of it. Um, yeah, right. So, yeah, so the reality is you're wrong 99.9999% of the time, but I'm trying to pill pull my way out of it, all right? Your religion leads you to a schizoid personality. Yeah, 
I guess it does, because if only I could be like you, who, who considers the thought and the deed exactly the same. Think about how much more advanced I could be. So given everyone considers murder, and yet 99.9999% of people don't commit murder, wow, if only I could be like you and see something as true that almost never happens. How much more advanced and integrated I could be if I could live in this delusional world where a stray thought and a stray fantasy are absolutely equivalent to going out and murdering, torturing, and raping people. Who is saying these comments? I'm responding to the comments by Aslov Sultan Bekov, and his comments reflect the, the point of view of probably 20, 30, 40% of Americans. So, uh, Richard Hananya, all right, uh, said some ill-advised things. I don't feel bad for the guy. He said it, he did it, he should uh, stand behind it. And he, he's really good at playing the game, right? Richard Hanani is really good at playing the game. He's built a really nice uh, career for himself. He's uh, you know, raised a lot of money. He's befriended the right people. He's gotten the, the, you know, the, the elite approving of him. He wanted to fly close to the sun, right? If uh, Richard Hanania had been more content with a, a lower profile, if he hadn't been so attention-seeking, if he hadn't been so histrionic, if he hadn't been so dramatic in his presentations, if he hadn't been such an effective player of the game, all right, then his downfall wouldn't be as, as big. But he wanted to fly close to the sun, and he got, uh, he got burned. And... Uh, I, I like the way he's approaching things. I hope he's strong enough to continue, and I hope he's strong enough to, to deal with the, the fallout. But great points have been raised on, on Twitter. Like, why don't ex-communists ever face the same repercussions that uh, Richard Hanania faces? Like, I rhetorically played with communism for about two years. I would tell people about age 20 and 21, I love telling people that I was an atheistic communist. It was a rhetorical ploy for me. I like to push buttons. And I never joined any communist organizations. I never went to com any communist meetings. I was not a card-carrying member of a communist party. I never did anything uh, related to communism beyond, I, I like, shocking people. And there was no pushback, no, no blowback, no damage to my life of which I'm aware. And a great deal of intellectual thought and a great deal of our elites have had you know, pretty intense flirtations with Marxism, and many of them still use a, a Marxist perspective on life. So what exactly is a communist or a Marxist perspective on life, you know, just A-OK, -okay, and someone with a right-wing approach to life, such as what Richard Hanania exemplified for many years under a pseudonym, you know, why does he need to be destroyed? Well, it just simply comes down to subjective hero systems. We have different hero systems. Now, if you try to approach it objectively, you can try to make the argument, well, objectively, large number of people in our society, particularly those with power and money and influence, those who control the cultural means of production, they take great offense at what Richard Ananya has said and will therefore punish him. So much of this just comes down to power, right? The left dominates our institutions. The left controls the cultural means of production. They have the means of punishing people with these kind of dissident views. So when will the right develop something equivalent to Media Matters, right? Media Matters is very effective, right? They do a really good job at, you know, taking clips that make right-wingers look stupid in the eyes of ordinary people. And they do a really good job of documenting that. They're very effective warriors for their cause. Why can't the right develop something similarly effective? Why can't the right go after people with communist backgrounds? Why can't the right... Know, attack the careers of people who are still embodying a, a communist and Marxist point of view. Like, when will the right take power in this country? When will the right take back institutions or effectively develop counter institutions and become more effective players of the power game? Right? A lot of this just comes down to power. I'd hope that uh, the right takes some lessons from this. That's uh, that's becoming much more effective at playing these kind of games. I think the Huffington Post article on Richard Hanania was fair. Why doesn't the right do things that are equally effective? Pay attention to details, fund 
intellectuals, fund intellectual publications, fund think tanks, fund institutions that can give careers to people like Richard Hanania and stand by them in these sort of situations, right? Why, why do Republicans so often just cuck to the left? Why are they so desirous of mainstream acceptance? Well, because the left controls the cultural means of production. Well, why not develop right-wing cultural means of production of a much higher quality than what the right is currently producing? Whoa, we've got uh, Dr. Mangala back in the chat. Welcome, Dr. Mangala. Did I read Richard Host back in the day? No, I don't recall ever reading him or thinking about him. Right wing is uh, probably too busy talking about Bill Gates' anal probes. Yeah, a lot of right wing punditry is moronic. And that's what I've been devoting this channel to over the past few months, kind of decoding how, how stupid it is. And uh, maybe it's time that the right picks up its game. And the right has picked up its game in many ways. It's developed alternative means of cultural production like Rumble. And I don't know if the people behind Odyssey are right wing. Maybe they're just libertarian. But we do have more choices in live streaming and in social media than we did a, a few years ago. Okay, I've never paid much attention to uh, Euron, Euron Brock. Is he, is he worth paying attention to? Right, let's give him a shot here. Gotten over that. So this breaking story about Richard Hanania that we're going to talk about, um, and I don't like to talk about breaking news because uh, you, you don't have the time and, and you don't have... Um, all the information and the commentary that comes afterwards, but but I'm pretty comfortable that I've got enough to say here, given uh, given what I know, and kind of given what Richard has posted since this news has come out, that there's enough to enough to talk about. This is not a pleasant topic. The only reason I'm doing this is that I have for a year now, two years maybe, did about okay, him. Uh, his book has blurbs from Peter Thiel and and many others. Um, uh, and uh, anyway, he's an up and coming rising star. Okay, I've given him three minutes and he hasn't said anything. Let me try one more chance. To basically uh, uh, sterilizing uh, anybody with an IQ below 90. Right? IQ below 90 and, and of course... It's okay, so different people have different hero systems. And that's what it comes down to. Maybe your hero system comes from Christianity. Maybe it's idiosyncratic. Maybe it comes from Judaism. We just simply have a clash of hero systems here. As part of that, mentioning and highlighting the fact that that would, in, that would be mostly black people, that is, that, that this involved mostly blacks. Um, you know, he, his, his rants, his essays, his articles, his posts, his comments um, are now well documented. They're out there. Uh, and yeah, I mean, this guy, this guy was an out and out, unequivocal, you know, horrible racist. Uh, of okay. Okay. <laughs> You're right. Uh, absolutely nothing to be gained from listening to him. I wonder what's going with Eki Lux live streams. Very encouraging. Very encouraging. Um, over the past several months, I have had multiple um, conversations and exchanges with regular straight ahead, either normie cons or liberals or whatever, who are now catching on. OMG, we are white. And it's no longer just a random factoid about yourself. Okay, so I know nothing about uh, Eki Lux aside from what, it, what he presents on live streams. In my life experience, I don't have a great deal of respect for 99% of people who talk this way because more than 99% of the time, their perspectives are based on a lack of understanding of U.S. Census data. They take the U.S. Census at its face that uh, you know, whites are going to become minorities in 2040 or, or 2050. They take all sorts of data on its face, and then they devote their life to a crusade for white racial consciousness, but they don't even understand the most basic facts that they are devoting their life to, and so therefore, how can I respect them? Right? You are exiling yourself from polite society. You are isolating yourself. You are setting yourself up for worlds of pain, you are very likely alienating yourself from your family, from the friends, the people you, you grew up with when you go on this white racial consciousness crusade. And it's almost always based on a faulty understanding of the data. As I've often talked about on this show, if you are 15 sixteenths white and 1 16th Chinese, as I am, and so if I were to put down at the U.S. Census Bureau data that I am 
both Asian and Caucasian. I would be counted solely as Caucasian, uh, solely as Asian, even though I'm 15 16 Caucasian. All right. If you put down that you're black and, and white, all right, like Obama, one white parent, one, one black parent, he would be counted solely as black. So the U.S. Census data is slanted towards providing a disproportionate number of non-whites and minimizing the number of whites. And yet people who go on these crusades that, that Eki Lux is on, they don't seem to have the, you know, the foggiest notion of the basis on which they go on such a crusade. So why would they, why would they go on these crusades when they don't know what they're talking about? Because everybody wants to feel like a hero, right? And so it's just absurd. It's hard to respect someone on a hero quest when it's based on an inability to understand basic data, right? When someone is coming at uh, this, they're controversial, they're isolating their perspective that will alienate them from family, friends, community, and uh, lead them to a small, constricted, unhappy, ineffective life and very likely, you know, down some kind of dark conspiracy rabbit hole. Yeah, it's hard for me to respect that. Completely unnecessary. Maybe understand what you're talking about. Maybe you know, develop other things in your life aside from becoming a, a race warrior. So in my experience, 99% of the people who talk like Eki Lux is talking here. And I don't know anything about Eki Lux, the, the human being, so I'm not talking about Eki Lux, the, the human being. I'm just talking about 99% of people I've known, I know anything about, who take on this, you know, white racial consciousness is their number one transcendent overall, you know, passion in life. Uh, usually they don't know very much, and usually they're marginalized losers. They're, they're consistently losing in life. So someone who's got a family, someone who's earning a good income, someone who's developing important skills, someone who is you know, cherished in their community, someone who's volunteering and making other people's lives better, all right? And then they have this as, you know, something in, in addition to a flourishing life. All right, I, I've got to respect that. They are pursuing an unpopular hero system. But overwhelmingly, I find that people who pursue the, the hero system that Eki Lux is describing, people who are rapidly devoted to that, they not only destroy their own lives, they not only keep themselves small and isolated and poor and marginalized and desperate and increasingly prone to conspiracy theories, but they damage the lives of everyone who cares about them. And they may play a role in predisposing you know, uh, unhinged personalities from going down a very dark path. So count me skeptical about uh, this attitude that Eki Lux is describing. It's no longer just a thing, you know, like today I'm wearing, uh, I don't know, a white shirt instead of a blue shirt, or, you know, I'm, I'm wearing a red jacket instead of a green jacket or whatever. It's not just a random thing. And there are many of them that are starting. This is happening IRL. I'm telling you, I'm in Los Angeles, okay? Here in Los Angeles, there are normal people, okay, people who are not clued in, people who don't spend time obsessively uh, browsing news sites and looking for, you know, very spicy headlines or whatever. I'm watching people become racially conscious around me. Now, a lot of it, to be fair, is happening on a... So for, for some people, developing a stronger in-group identity is a good thing, right? But in, in my experience, 99% of people who become more racially conscious end up damaging their lives and damaging the lives of people who care about them. So it just seems to me that these sort of marginalized ideas primarily you know, attract marginalized people. And people who are on the margins of life, right? People who are on the fringes, right? They're much more likely to get picked off by the wolves in the world, right? How do you stay safe? How do you maximize your safety, your flourishing, your happiness, and your effectiveness? By staying in the middle of the herd. Right, staying right in the middle of your community, among your loved ones, among people in your profession, among people with your interests, among people with your educational attainment, with, with people with your hobbies, 
with people with your devotions, with your faith community, with your religious and ethnic commitments, right? Stay right in the middle, right? And you tend to thrive. So in-group identity, yeah, usually a good thing. But if you're taking on an in-group identity that is as regarded as heinous and disgusting and, you know, attacked as, you know, white racial consciousness in America today, uh, you're very likely to fall out of balance. You're very likely to damage your life when there are just far more effective ways of building up a good life. You could join a church, right? Churches tend to be racially homogeneous. So if you're really devoted to what you're talking about, you know, go join a church or go join an Orthodox synagogue, right? Orthodox synagogues are overwhelmingly composed of Ashkenazi Jews who overwhelmingly consider themselves white. Uh, Go join a book club or a a poetry club or go volunteer, all right? You can have real life, concrete, in-group commitments and and community with whoever you want to join, right? You just have to use some good sense in taking into consideration what will be the effect of my words. It doesn't matter that you're ontologically uh, right and pure in, in your perspectives. You have to take into consideration what will be the effect of my words on other people. How will that cause them to react to me? How will that cause them to react to what is dear and precious to me? Right? You can be 100% correct and ill-advised to say things that you believe are 100% correct you know, to just people indiscriminately. You have to use good judgment should never say anything to people that they can't handle because people won't react well to that. They will just marginalize you and distance themselves, right? You start talking this way and 98% of people will want nothing to do with you, which will deem you to a really miserable life, an ineffective life, a poorer life, an isolated life, a life on the margins, right? A life you know, away from the herd where you're much more likely to get picked off by the wolves that uh, dominate the, the world around us. So here's Chris Mooney talking about the Republican brain. I'm first aware of a body of research on a topic called biased or motivated reasoning. And one important researcher is actually an old friend of mine. His name is Brendan Nyhan. He's a political scientist at Dartmouth now, but I remember him back when he was a journalist like me in DC. And we were always concerned even then about why there are all these crazy wrong claims in politics and they pollute the discourse and they never seem to go away. All right. So he started to study this scientifically, and what he did in one of his interesting experiments was he constructed fake newspaper articles, and he had liberals and conservatives read them. Of course, he's testing their political beliefs before he gives them the actual article to read. And what he did in the article was that the article would contain a factual claim made by a politician, often George W. And let's have a look at the chat. Uh, Ricardo says, LOL, uh, restreaming Eki Lux. Eki's pretty intense on Twitter. He's in every reply posting Jewish memes. Where does he find the time? He's like the Energizer bunny of uh, naming them. Richard Hanania is so unpopular that Luke can't even get into double digits with his name in the stream title. <laughs> Two truths, one for the people and one for yourself. Yeah, y- you have to take into account other people. I know you don't want to take into account other people. It's like, F everybody else. I just want to do what's right in my own head. Well, good luck with that. It's it's like when so many people come on the stream and push back at the idea of stay in your lane, and their attitude is, F, stay in your lane. I'm not going to stay in my lane. And so I say, don't stay in your lane. Get out there and get out of your lane. Drive down the freeway at 80 miles an hour and change lanes constantly, right? Go to work and start telling your boss how things really are. Start telling your mother, you know, how the world really is. Uh, start telling random strangers how the world really is. Uh, When you see a police officer, you know, go over there and hug him and pretend to, you know, make a move for his gun, right? Get out of your lane and see how that works. So obviously words are just, you know, digital, uh, just uh, metaphors for reality. But from from my limited life experience, people who get out of their lane, uh, generally speaking, right, it, it damages their life and it damages the lives of those around them. People who stay in their lane, Generally speaking, that kind of attitude seems to enhance their life. Megan Rapino should have stayed in her life. Yeah, so I was rooting for the Women's World Cup American uh, soccer soccer team. I, I was rooting for them. I was watching the penalty shootout live. I, so I only watched a 
about five minutes live at the, the Women's World Cup, but I was rooting for them. And then as soon as they lost, I just changed frames in my head and I was glad that they'd lost. So I'd have been glad that they won, glad that they lost. And I think this is what happy people tend to do. They tend to look for, you know, whatever frame, whatever perspective uh, provides them with happiness. And so when the Dallas Cowboys win, my favorite football team, I'm happy. And then when the, the Dallas Cowboys lose, I try to reframe it. Okay, good. This will, you know, separate me from, you know, something that's degenerate, something I should not spend so much emotional energy on. This is how, how the world works. And, you know, let me try to do the best with it. As opposed to when I've been in a depressive state, and then I would just reframe everything that happens as, you know, terrible, <laughs> that we're, we're doomed. And so I notice with most uh, right-wing uh, dissidents, they reframe everything in terms of we are doomed, right? They're absolutely addicted to feeling doomed. And then happy people, they're, they really enjoy feeling happy, so they just keep reframing everything that happens, trying to make the, the best of it. Now, when I suffer a serious setback, right, you'll notice me on some days, you know, I'm less happy than others, less energy than others, or sometimes I won't stream for a week. I'll make very few streams for two or three weeks, and it's usually because I've had some setbacks in my life. I did hardly any streams between 2012 and 2014 because I was really struggling with my credit card debt, with my life overall. Uh, I was struggling to you know, come to terms with the reality of my life, and I just didn't have the strength, and I wasn't able to you know, reframe things in, in a positive and effective manner. And even now, you know, I suffer my humiliations. Right? I suffer my losses. I suffer my you know, broken dreams. And it's, it's a setback. I don't try to reframe everything in, into a positive way. There has to be, I think, a few minutes a day where you feel your pain, you feel your loss, you feel your humiliation. So I don't know, maybe I probably average, probably average 15 minutes a day feeling sad, meaning, you know, there are days where I spend probably two hours feeling sad and then nothing at all for, for a week. But uh, generally speaking, happy people like feeling happy. They keep reframing things into a ways that uh, make them feel good. Unhappy people become addicted to unhappiness and to losing, and they just constantly reframe things you know, in, in alignment with, uh, with losing. All right. Chris Mooney, a lefty, here talking about the Republican brain. Bush. And it would be a factual claim, a real quote that, you're, that George W. Bush had said, something like saying that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction or saying that the tax cuts... Okay, who is Eki Lux? Eki Lux used to be a regular on this stream. And he tends to say the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. There's not a great deal of variety to what he has to say. So I think he would be more effective. I think he would benefit by, you know, expanding his interests. It, it, he just seems to have a one-track interest, white racial consciousness, Jews are terrible, right? Two tracks, right? Those two tracks, and there, there never seems to be anything aside from those two tracks. So, yeah, I, I think Steve Saylor makes a good point about women's soccer. Maybe we shouldn't be venerating the American women's soccer team because women are too delicate for this type of physical sport, or there's a good, strong argument to be made the women are too delicate because they're something like two to eight times more likely than men to get all sorts of really nasty, really severe injuries. I mean, it's obvious that women are much more delicate than men. Why would one encourage women to engage in activities that are between, say, 200 times to you know, 800 times more significantly dangerous for them th than for men? I, probably not a, a good idea. People can't handle having their bubble poked. Yeah, that's true for me too. <laughs> I mean, I get, I get peaked, I get hurt, I get butt hurt, I get sore. You know, I have my own bubbles that I live in. Richard Hananya is the most disliked man in America. Megan Rapino, the most disliked woman. Why won't Richard Hananya go away? He's, he's like open borders. No one wants it, but we don't have a choice. Well, he's got a lot of powerful friends and he's got a lot of money behind him. Megan Rapino should have stayed in. Yeah, if she hadn't started talking out on politics and LGBTQ rights, right, uh, there wouldn't be as much rejoicing by conservatives 
uh, the American women's soccer team losing. And it was so obnoxious that they, you know, made this great big campaign for equal pay when a group of 14-year-old boys can absolutely thrash them. Right? The quality of soccer that a, a women's team, even the purported best women's team in the world, the American soccer team, the quality of performance and meaning entertainment, sports or entertainment, the quality of the entertainment that they convey is decidedly inferior compared to the male version. Just like there are a lot of activities where women are far superior in general to what men can do. Eki Lux is making his own drive as lane. Eki Lux making his own lane as he drives his tractor trailer of a Twitter account right through the heart of Jewish power. I like Eki. He seems to have a soul. It, yeah, he is, he is likable, right? I've never rooted for the U.S. women's national team. Women's sports is inherently a political project. It masculinizes women. I like Eki. I don't think all that posting is accomplishing his goals. Otto Wedinger was right about women. Don't remember what he said. Whenever I feel sad, I simply remember my favorite things, like raindrops on roses. All feelings are transitory, and whiskers on kittens. He's on Twitter. Yeah, Eki keeps his talking points in his lane. Yeah, he's uh, staying in his lane. But if your lane is headed towards oncoming traffic, I would suggest taking a different lane. Why do all female soccer players look mannish? Well, I noticed many of the Swedish soccer players who knocked out America look quite attractive. So there are many uh, attractive female soccer players. Men's soccer is boring. Women's soccer is the square root of boring. We're all bubble people. I am woman, hear me bore. Male pole dancing is lame, even for gay men. <laughs> Ricardo says youth soccer is the, the vanguard of political homosexuality. So, yeah, having disdain for soccer is probably a healthy American thing because if you're American, why don't you love American sports, right? Every nation should love its own sports. It's part of having a strong in-group identity. And part of strong in, having a strong in-group identity is that you have some disdain and hostility and negative feelings about other countries in their foreign ways, including their foreign sports. All right, back to Chris Mooney decoding the Republican brain. Increased revenue to the government. Right? These are false claims. Right? And in, in the latter case, it's probably you know, economically or even physically impossible. Uh, so he would, and then in some of the fake articles, the journalist would step in and say, this is not true, this is not correct. In other articles, the journalist would do no such thing, which is what journalists usually do, no such thing. Uh, so what happened, what happened in this research when conservatives are reading a claim by George W. Bush that they believe that's false, and then the, the journalist says it's false? What happens to their belief in the claim? All right. Has anybody seen the movie Swingers? Are you guys too young for that? <laughs> Have you, anybody played blackjack? What do you do if you get a 10 or 11 in blackjack? Double down. Double down. That's what the conservatives did. Okay, so here's the essence of Chris Mooney and his book, The Republican Brain. Right, he's got intriguing physiological explanations for why conservatives may be less disposed towards expressive moderation than liberals. So apparently, uh, conservatives have a stronger fight or flight resp response. They tend to have a larger right amygdala, which is the evolutionary, more ancient part of the brain that generates fight or flight responses. Supposedly, liberals possess more gray matter in the anterior cingulate cortex. Right, the evolutionarily newer system that suspends the amygdala's automatic responses to assess facts and detect errors. So he says conservatives tend to be more instinctive, more given to immediate reflex actions. Liberals more reflective and cognitive, better able to suspend automatic fear responses to undertake a more careful evaluation of the facts. So the ideology of conservatives and liberals is reflected in their physiology. Every human, just like every animal, possesses a fear system capable of rapid-fire defensive reactions. But that rapid-fire defensive reaction is stronger and more predominant among conservatives. And I think that may well be right. And in some situations, the conservative response will be more adaptive. And in other situations, the left-wing response will be more adaptive. I don't think either is automatically set out by the will of heaven to 100% be correct. So... Mooney argues that conservatives' larger amygdala, right, their fight or flight effect, changes how they process information, including political information. So liberals and conservatives differ not only in the content of their beliefs, but also in the rigidity with which they hold them. So conservatives tend to have a greater need for closure than do liberals. So conservatives prefer books and poetry and 
TV shows and movies and novels that have a, a, an ending, that have closure. Uh, liberals tend to have a more open personality. They tend to have um, less conscientiousness than conservatives. Conservatives tend to be higher in conscientiousness than liberals, and they tend to have a more closed personality. Uh, they doubled down on their false belief. They believed it stronger than before after it was refuted. Right. So what is up with that? Right. Clearly, you need some kind of psychological explanation for something like that occurring. And not only was there this research on what's called motivated reasoning, uh, we also see in a lot of research, and I was becoming aware of this, this tendency for conservatives who know more about an issue, or, who, or at least think they know more about an issue, to be more factually wrong about it than if they know less. All right. And I call this in the book the smart idiot effect. All right. and it's very, very important for understanding. Okay, so I was listening to a moderately lefty podcast called Psych. Got a couple of, uh, couple of fairly well-known psychologists, David Pizarro and uh, Bloom from, from Yale. Here they are. Chapter 13 of this podcast talking about individual differences. Yeah. Make sure they know you heard about GiveWell from Psych to get your donation matched. Wait, wait, Our thanks wait, to GiveWell for sponsoring wait, wait. this stop, episode stop, of Psych. Stop, stop, stop. So okay. personality is one of the major ways people differ that we talk about as psychologists. Another is intelligence. And there's just debate about personality. There's a lot of debate about intelligence. A few, a few basics about intelligence. First, the average intelligence is 100 as tested by the IQ test. This isn't because of some miraculous convergence of a perfect number. It's because the tests are scaled to be at 100. It shows a sort of standard bell curve that you could kind of just pluck up from your imagination. And IQ, as tested within societies like ours, it's not so clear if we get the same result in 100 gathered societies and so on, uh, correlates, is related to most good things in life. So people with higher IQ. Okay, psych podcast with David Pizarro, psychologist, and Paul Bloom, a psychologist at Yale, this is Paul Bloom speaking. Views are healthier, they're happier, they're uh, kinder, uh, in, according to, to various tests. They're less racist or less sexist, and they do better in life. They, they do better job performance in the military, they do better at school, they test better, and so on. I think it was uh, Stuart Ritchie who said there's only one negative thing that correlates with high IQ, and that's uh, bad eyesight. <laughs> right. I think there is a very strong stereotype that people who are high in IQ are less happy. And that's just not borne out by the research. We have some stereotypes. We have the, the sort of image of a child prodigy who grows up to be miserable, but that's, that's not the norm. Yeah, that's right. There's obviously diminishing returns. So the difference between being an IQ of, say, 90 going up to 100 is very big from 100 to 110 is, um, is really big. And then as it gets up and up and up, the difference fades. You get diminishing returns. And then kind of the same way you get diminishing returns from money. If you make uh, $50,000 a year and someone gives you another 50000 that's going to make a huge difference. If you make half a million. Okay, this is, uh, I don't think he's correct here. There are significant differences between people, between large groups with a 160 IQ and a 150. There is no level of IQ at which there, there are no differences, right? People with 170 levels of IQ, if you've got a, you know, a large enough group, they accomplish far more than people with a 160 average IQ. It won't be much of a difference. But some people have said that to the say, well, and then too much intelligence is, is, is no good at all. Maybe it's bad for you. It makes you kind of, a, kind of uh, you know, awful in some way, takes you away from other people. It turns out not to be true. So I cite this study. I do a jokey thing in my book. I'll just read this aloud I have in front of me. In one classic decade-long study, psychologists took 320 children who tested before the age of 13 as having high mathematical or verbal skills at a top 10, one in 10,000. Then they looked at the same individuals 20 years later to see how they did in life, focusing on their occupations. And it turned out their lives were awful because they were total nerds. And then I write, no, I'm just kidding. You get to do it only once in a book before people hate you. But no, actually, they tend to do pretty well in life. They were scientists, journalists, politicians, CEOs, leaders in societies, other studies looking at people in the top 1% of mathematical reasoning. And you may think mathematical reasoning, well, that's, you know, this isn't math. Who cares? But they were overrepresented in, in just all the good things, all the good jobs you want. Uh, they wrote more books. They, 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 they had higher positions and so on. So there seems to be a positivity of intelligence. Now, the reason for the positivity is unclear. Let me just give a short riff on this, which is always interesting to me, I feel, because I think people often get it wrong. What you might be tempted to think is that your intelligence basically it makes you smarter, and smarter people thrive in some objective sense in the world. It's just better to be smart when dealing in the world. And I think that's true to some extent. But I also think, and this is a point brought up by people like Freddie DeBoer and Paige Harden, that to some extent, we have created a world where intelligence is highly valued. Um, to get into the best schools in the United States, for instance, you have to do I mean, how would you create any kind of first world civilization and not highly value intelligence? I think this is a really weak point. Do extremely well in academic test testing on the SATs, later on the LSATs and everything. And these are in some way IQ tests. And once people end up in, you know, in Princeton or Harvard Law or whatever, their lives are very good. The world rewards their, their graduation from these places. But, and then psychologists come and say, look, 
IQ is correlated to positive life outcomes. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. But we set it up that way. I mean, yeah. again, not entirely. I think even if we, had, I think being smart in some unspecified way would, would be good no matter what. But so much of it is, is the result of a world in which this was, this was prized, this exceptional prize. I think that's a really good point and one that I really never think about. Um, but of course, that has to be true. I mean, we deal in admissions. Would I rather have a show on YouTube or on Fox? It would depend on the resources behind the show. And is there more freedom to speak on Fox News than YouTube? Not much of a difference. So if uh, there were considerable resources behind the, I guess I'd like a show on Rumble, right, with resources. We admit students and you you try your best to admit on the basis of a whole bunch of criteria, but we can't lie and say that this, that intelligence isn't one one dimension that we're trying to assess when we're picking who's going to be a PhD student with us. And we, I, have the lay theory that that's because they will be better students. But I am also feeding into this very mechanism. We're causing these outcomes. Yeah. It's like, I, I just see an example on the fly. It would be as if we found that height is tremendously correlated with athletic skills and only athletic sport we we, we had was basketball. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, like, it's simply an enormous correlation, height in that. Way. But if we had if we had other sports, the correlation would, would drop. We're going to talk about heredity and where these things come from in a bit. But, but the logic extends deeper than that. Suppose you find that, that there's a real genetic influence on, on say, so there's a conversation about resources going on in, in the chat. Uh, perhaps the most valuable resource you can have is solid, genuine self-esteem, right? Genuinely liking yourself, respecting yourself. That's a huge resource. Right? For many people, having genuine self-esteem would be worth more to them than having thousands of dollars in the bank. Because if you genuinely like yourself, you will be attracted to people who are good for you and you'll flee from people who are bad for you. And so you will make much better choices around people. So perhaps the most valuable resource you can have is having an accurately positive relationship with yourself. And then next most valuable resource is having a good relationship with your family, extended family, friends, and community, right? You want to survive an earthquake. You want to survive inflation. You want to survive unemployment, right? You want to survive tragedy and conflict. The best thing you can do is to have resources such as family, friends, community with whom you're on good terms. And then, yeah, money, that helps too. Uh, getting a PhD or getting, or getting a great job. The genetic influence might work that it wires up, the genes wire up your brain to be really smart and capable. And that's how. I didn't consistently start liking myself until 2016 when I began putting into action, like took, you know, multiple jobs and started driving down my credit card debt and started building a life that was working from, you know, some days I'd get up at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., you know, get to work early, I'd work until 9 p.m., driving down my credit card debt, uh, connected to 12-step programs that were working for me, and my whole life just started working. My whole life really started taking off in 2016. So since, since January of 2016, I've consistently liked myself. It works. But it doesn't have to work that way. In any society, and this applies to all societies, where there are some other biases, the genes could instead code in ways that favor the biases. So suppose suppose being good looking helps you get a good job and helps you get into a good school and there's probably enormous bias in favor of good looking. Then the genes will have an effect on us because genes have some effect on how good looking you are. Suppose skin color plays a role in your fate in life, also true everywhere on earth. Then your genes will have a, an effect, a correlation, on your fate in life because genes control skin color. This isn't just sort of being picky. It's worth appreciating that that genetic influence on. So I was just watching uh, Richard Spencer on Ethan Rouse's show, and he was drinking beer while he was on a show. So consuming alcohol while you're on a live stream is absolutely an adaptive behavior for some people, but I think it's a really bad choice for others, such as uh, Richard Spencer. I mean, I, I think Chuck that's Johnson, a, a of course, choice. it was about me and Fuentes and all that stuff. Um, what's your lay of the land on that? If you want to weigh in on that, um, uh, I feel like I've just looked. I, I feel like I can look at Fuentes objectively in a way because I don't have anything at, at stake with him. Um, it, you know, back in 2017, it was kind of like Fuentes versus Spencer, and uh, on, in a, in a very major way. There, there are other factors involved, but I, I, I think you know the optics war and all, all. You know, what about what do we think about Charlottesville, et cetera? I think a lot of that is water under the bridge, and and I can just look at him objectively. I don't have anything at stake with him, so I don't 
vehemently hate him. I don't want to join his movement and I feel like I can criticize him objectively and, and, and accurately. Um, he came on to the scene as this conservative kid who I think was getting some traction among conservatives. And he wanted, he was obviously pro-Trump at some, you know, he still is now, but he was very pro-Trump at some point, even though he, he had been anti-Trump, I think when he was in high school or some crazy thing like that. Um, and he wanted to move the alt-right away from being the alt-right. That is and a great comment in the chat from John Berkshire. Leaving the alt-right was the best thing Richard Hanania ever did. Compare his career to that of Richard Spencer. Hanania is friends with important politicians, billionaires, and other high IQ right-wingers. Carter says Richard Spencer doesn't do the work. I guess he doesn't have to. Not his fault. Richard is blessed with leisure. He seems to enjoy being at home with the kids. Richard Spencer is about the worst Wikipedia page imaginable, and he tries to rebrand himself as a Biden-loving NATO-supporting liberal, but to no avail. Richard will always be seen as a disgusting neo-Nazi, no matter what he does. Carter says, I need more Richard and Chuck Johnson spaces. Richard Ananya has a career. Come on, bro. He's 100% astroturfed. And the chat demands a pill eater. It's away from being an alternative right and being a kind of hyper-conservative you know, hard right, we love Trump, we take no prisoners kind of thing. And I think he successfully did that. I mean, he successfully won that war. And I think he, in a weird way, successfully won the Graper War in the sense that, uh, you know, TPUSA, Charlie Kirk, Marjorie Taylor Greene were kind of stealing his talking points. Uh, I guess, as we learned today, literally hiring Graipers. And, and uh, basically just, they, they didn't, there was no more division between the Graipers and mainstream conservatives because the conservatives took it all on. They're anti-vaccine, they're uh, stop the steal, their Trump is our Jesus, et cetera, et cetera. And so he, in a way, won all of those battles, even as he got increasingly pushed out. Um, now, I noticed this in 2020. I noticed this before then. I certainly noticed this now. There were these really bad characters. Okay. And then his voice starts roboting something awful. A little bit more here from Paul Bloom talking with David Bizarro about IQ. On an accomplishment, even an accomplishment of value, may be mediated, may, be, may do its work through something else society has and maybe something society shouldn't have. I already know some listeners are going to say, well, you've been talking about IQ and intelligence as if they are the same thing. And there are a lot of people who are suspicious of IQ tests. And so equating intelligence with IQ is maybe for some people something that has to be defended. Yeah, and I think I, I actually think that's a, a, a fair enough objection. They're different things. Intelligence is sort of a hypothesized notion of sort of a general reasoning ability. Reason, plan, yeah. uh, learn from experience, be, adapt to novel circumstances. And an IQ test is a test is a test of that that people have thought up. So, I don't know, for instance, you could be an incredibly intelligent, but if you can't read words on IQ tests because um, you don't know language and no one's offered you a translation, or you come from another culture, or you're visually impaired and no one, no one offers to give you any help to it, you'll do terrible on IQ tests even though you could be very smart. So, I think what you could say is the fact that the IQ test seems to have various predictive power. I think, I think in general, somebody who scores 140 is going to just be a better reasoner than somebody who scores 100, suggests that there's some correlation. But you absolutely cannot conflate intelligence with, with the test to assess intelligence any more than you should, you should reduce personality to the test we use to assess personality. And this is why, particularly, I think we should be very skeptical about uh, studies that apply IQ tests often created for use in the United States and then apply them to other countries. Because there's all sorts of reasons when you sort of diverge from the situation where people are sort of most, have the test most crafted them, where these tests start to go awry. Even something as simple as there's a certain thing called test taking skill, which, which you get in school. And you, you, you probably if you had dropped an intelligence test for people who had no formal education, no matter how smart they are, they're going to bomb it because they just don't know how to take tests. Yeah. I mean, anxiety can do that to many students, yeah. for instance. Yeah. That's right. Should we talk about G? Yeah, I think so. So an IQ test is attempting to find the underlying dimension of intelligence, right? So the attempt is to say, what can we measure that will tell us whether or not somebody is intelligent or not? And over the years, people have developed a whole bunch of different kinds of tasks. And if you take an IQ test or if you've taken one, you'll realize that you're getting a, a bunch of different kinds of questions. Some of them may involve reaction time. Some of them may involve memory. Some are just about verbal ability, your ability to, to recognize, uh, to know words. Some are just mathematical ability or your uh, ability to do calculations in your head. So the question might be, well, if an IQ test has, say, five components, Who's to say that you just haven't measured five things? How can you lump all of these together? An analogy I like to think about is uh, an athletic analogy. Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah. And this is, this is one, I, it's not original to me, but I, but I put it in a book, which is, you know, it could be that these five things are totally separate, in which case they'd be totally unrelated. So, you know, certainly some things are, are, are highly separate. If you, if you, you tell. So what's my perfect dream life, right? Who would I be? What would I do? It would be pretty similar to the life I have now, except I would dream that I would have a family, you know, a wife and kids. And that I would have 
you know, more time to pursue my intellectual passions. So I would like to do more thoughtful, more prepped shows. I'd love to have, say, a producer to work with on the shows and co-hosts, a panel of people to do shows with and to have more time that I could devote to my, my shows, to my writing, to my, my reading. Uh, otherwise, you know, pretty happy with the, with the life I have. Tested, I don't know, tested people on, on how far they could jump. And when they roll a dice, do they get a heads or tails? It's totally different. The components of an intelligence test seem to be connected similar to the components of athletic tests. So imagine you brought in people and you had a bunch of tests. How fast can you run a mile? How much can you bench press? How flexible are you? No, 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 different things. Now, plainly, some people are going to do better than others on this. So you'll have somebody who's just this weightlifter who could bench press an enormous amount, but not so flexible. You could have this person who is, who is a, you know, a, a, an incredibly fast runner but doesn't have much upper body strength. They get a difference. You get different scores. Everybody will have a different profile. But you'll also notice something else, which is there are some people in general who are pretty physically fit. A young man or woman, 20 years old, who does sports at school, probably do pretty well at all of these. A 90-year-old, sickly with, with various conditions, will probably do poorly on all of these. And so in addition to the separate scores, you could have a sort of score, which is how much overall do you do? What we call that for intelligence, G. I think you say this in the book. It didn't have to turn out this way. That's right. They're all pretty highly correlated with each other. It yeah, Ricardo says, my dream life has Luke, Duvet, and I moving into the Playboy Mansion and reclaiming its former glory as a podcast studio. <laughs> really didn't have to turn out that way, but that it did is, I think, a good piece of evidence that we're capturing something general, and there's the G is for general, uh, means something. Now, why? It could be that your G, your overall score, is capturing... Okay, a smart comment in the, the chat. Richard Hanania is an unsufferable narcissist. I, I, I agree. That's... That just uh, doesn't just drip off him. It just, you know, pours out of him. But why is he an insufferable narcissist? Obviously, he's not neuronormal. And so he, I'm sure he didn't have an easy life. And so to compensate for his social failings, he's developed this rich, you know, fantasy life where he's a hero. I identify with that. I mean, it's something that, you know, probably happened to, to me a great deal. I would retreat into fantasy because fantasy would numb my pain and I'd immediately feel better. So I think Richard Anania, like myself, like Richard Spencer, we've lived a great deal of our life, you know, fantasizing about how amazing and heroic and brave and strong and wise and far-seeing we are. And the, the narcissism is a compensation device for an inability to relate to other people normally. I would like to think that I've grown and developed on my abilities to relate to people in a little bit more normal fashion. Something basic about mental capacities. It could be yeah. just like a processor. This is capturing like just how powerful your brain is. It could be that the tasks that are being measured have some serious overlap in the domain. So some, some of them might be about memory plus arithmetic, and some of them are about arithmetic plus processing speed and, and so, so on. So you're getting overlapping measurement of certain domains. I think it's up for debate, but I don't think that there is a lack of evidence that there is a reasonable way in which we can say this is capturing some, some broad dimension. Yeah, I think so. And I think you're right in saying not only is it sort of logically possible, these components could have been separate. A lot of people think they are separate. Like... And also, what kind of life do I want? I mean, I have an ego. <laughs> Shocking. You know, stop the presses breaking news. I, I have an ego. I would like to be more successful than I am. I would like to have higher status than I do. I would like to be more accomplished than I am. I would like to be producing, you know, more substantial bodies of work, writing uh, books, uh, videos, movies, uh, TV, film scripts, etc. Yeah, I've, I've got, you know, selfish, egoistic concerns. But I know if I just follow my own promptings, I'm going to get into trouble. So I would also like to be more helpful than I am to make more of a contribution to the community around me. I'd like to be more of a blessing to other people in my life because I know that that's simply a path in life that makes me happier and more effective and is more likely to keep me out of the Vegemite and keep me dinky dye, fair dinkum and true blue. There's a cliche, and I, for all I know, I, I once probably believed it, which is, you have somebody who's very brainy at math. They're not going to have a high vocabulary. Yeah, they, they have this big, they're, they're math specialists, and they don't read, and so on. They'll be worse than average in, in reading, and it's just not true. But we have this conservation view. We have it more generally. You see somebody who's, who's good-looking and, and a jock, and you think, maybe you think there's some sort of cosmic justice. Well, So generally speaking, all right, I find that intelligence 
more often than not goes along with fairly even and, and attractive physiognomy, right? It does seem like intelligence goes along with all sorts of other gifts. Not always. They're not going to be so smart. Frustratingly, for, for some of us, people who are good looking and strong and good at math are also good at poetry <laughs> on average. And also, you know, uh, show other abilities. Well, sadly, if you're bad at just about every, if, if you're bad at five or six things, the odds are not that for the sixth thing, you're going to be skyrocketingly good. And if you have a sixth thing, you won't be so good either. And, you know, we, and we think of all sorts of, of reasons for that. Some, some psychological, some social, which is if you have a lot of gifts, maybe you're in an environment that nourishes all of your gifts in a way much more than somebody who has fewer gifts. There is a difference, at least one, that intelligence researchers like to uh, point out. So you can divide intelligence into what they refer to as fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence. I've always thought maybe this is just a way of feel, making aging people feel a bit better about themselves. So fluid intelligence means the raw processing power. That stuff, unfortunately, starts going down with age. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's distinctively a difference between the raw processing power of a 21-year-old compared to an 18-year-old. Right, here's just a little bit more from this podcast on parents, how much do they influence how much do they shape their children? Being athletic, a whole cluster of those things converge to make you good at college basketball. And again, from the examples of, say, uh, eye color or skin color or attractiveness, a cluster of genes that correlate, make heritable, some sort of intellectual attainment like graduating, graduating from college, doesn't have to affect your brain at all. It could work through other routes. So there's a big surprise in behavioral genetics. This is, this is maybe the most surprising thing I say to my intro psych class. And some days I don't believe it myself, but there's enough evidence for it. The surprise isn't that so much of our mental life, our mental differences, are controlled by the genes, say, correlate 50 percent or whatever. The surprise is where the other 50 percent comes from. So a lot of people think, OK, how, how intelligent I am, how introverted, extroverted, how happy I am. A big, big chunk of that's determined by my genes, say 50 percent. The other 50 percent I must get from my mom and dad, how they raise me. And it turns out the evidence suggests that that's not true. The evidence suggests that the other 50 percent, the environment, the stuff that's not genetic, doesn't really come from the household. There's a lot of evidence that how you're raised within people who are not coming from severe poverty or severe abuse, doesn't have that much of a role on your IQ or your personality. To put it differently, parents matter an enormous amount. Parents matter because they typically provide the genes that, that make you you to tremendous extent. Parents matter because how they raise you plays a huge role in how all of those years, more than a decade of childhood, how that works out, how happy you are. But parents, in terms of how they parent you, doesn't seem to have a big effect on whether you're open to new experience, agreeable, neurotic, and so on. So this raises a... Yeah, that uh, seems to be... Both true and important. All right, you're probably wondering what the heck is going on in uh, in Canada. I'm literally shaking right now. I was just getting groceries, and I live in San Francisco, and I never really oh. feel fully safe. If you live in San Francisco, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. And I just got groceries. I'm walking out of the store, and this guy is walking past me and says, move, you stupid bitch, and he spits in my face. Spits all over my face. And then I say, excuse me, did you just spit in my face? And he says, move or I'll rape you. There's also people everywhere and everyone's just walking by because they're like, I can't handle something else in San Francisco. It's always something else. I don't even know why I'm posting this. If you live in San Francisco, do you feel this way all the time? I don't feel safe, ever. I literally never feel safe. It's better when it's daylight. But nighttime, no, not leaving my house. <laughs> oh, I wonder who would act that I'm way. I'm literally shaking not, right now. Not, not Canada. Sorry, San Francisco. Seems so similar to Canada. <laughs> All right, this is uh, Japanese people thanking America for nuking them, saying the bombing was probably necessary to some extent. Wow. Japanese even thank America for, for nuking them. Amazing really cool question. If it's not your genes and it's not how you were parented that makes you different, what is it? What's the missing piece of the environment? And um, nobody knows. Some people think it's your peer group, that that causes your personality to change in some way. Some people think it's just your, your random events that happen in people's lives. You know, you, you fall in love, you get, you get sick right before an exam, you win a lottery, you get hit by a car, and that this plays a role. And um, I just find this a really neat question, but I don't have much to say about it. So let's get back to parenting. What do you think? Do you, do you buy this claim that uh, parents don't matter? I think that it is such a natural thought as a parent that all of your behaviors are going to determine the psychology of your child. Like, am I exposing my daughter to books or classical music? Am I feeding her brain in the right way? And maybe, maybe we as Americans, this gets back to the question uh, that we talked about in development, that parents in the United States often want to play this very important role in maximizing how good their kids are at all sorts of things. It's a tough pill to swallow, though. Yeah, it is. It is. And there's, there's so many forces that kind of push us away from it. First thing, there are, of course... Okay, 
You're probably wondering what the heck is going on with uh, Justin Trudeau. Future, what would you like your government's legacy on LGBT issues to be? Uh, to get it to a point when uh, we have an LGBT uh, prime minister and nobody notices. Looking into the future, what would you like your government's legacy on LGBT issues to be? And uh, what's going on at the White House? agreement that it is incorrect to say the 2020 election was stolen. What about the 2016 election? Look, I'm not going to go back into history. It was a stolen election. It was stolen. Stolen. He's an illegitimate president. He's an illegitimate president. You know, pretending to be president. Why do you think the president is going to such great lengths to essentially prove that he beat you? Because he didn't. One third of Clinton supporters say Trump election is not legitimate. I right. think he's an illegitimate president that didn't really win. You are absolutely right. You can run the best campaign. You can even become the nominee and you can have the election stolen from you. The 2016 election was stolen. Got a nicer way to say that? Say Russia hacked the election. Russia hacked our election. Russia hacked our election. A little louder, please. Russia hacked our election. That was a 9-11 scale event. This was a kind of cyber 9-11. Cyber 9-11. Yes. Russia hacked our election. Russia, you know, of course, hacked our election here. Half of Clinton's voters believe the conspiracy theory that Russia hacked election day votes. We know that they were into voting rolls actual interference with the elections themselves. We know it happened. Despite no credible evidence, 67% of Democrats believe Russia tampered with vote tallies. Hacking the U.S. election. Hacking the U.S. election. Russia hacked our election. The Russians hacked our election. Russia hacked our election. Russia hacked our election. Russian hacking of our election. Hacking of our, our, of our election. Russia hacked our election. Russia hacked our election. The stolen election. Russia hacked our election. Russia hacked our election. The universal assessment that Russia hacked our election. Election 2016. Foreign governments hacked our elections. Most young Americans consider Donald Trump an illegitimate president. An illegitimate president. He's an illegitimate president. Why is he See, illegitimate? He just won an election. He's an illegitimate president in my mind. That's it. I absolutely agree. Experts urge Clinton Kent to challenge election results. We will see how illegitimate his victory actually was. He's an illegitimate president. Russia hacked our election. Russians hacking our election. Hacked our election. Russia hacking our election. I don't see the president elect as a legitimate president. Trump is an illegitimate president who stole the election. He is not a president. He's illegitimate. And my biggest fear is that he's going to do it again with the help of Vlad, his best pal. It's terrifying. Would you be my vice president? <laughs> Hillary Clinton voters call to overturn election results. More than 4 million people have already signed a petition on change.org calling for the electors of the Electoral College to quote, ignore their states, votes and cast their ballots for Secretary Clinton. Trump didn't actually win the election in 2016. We are the victims of a bloodless coup. He didn't win the general election. Yo, Electoral College, make Hillary Clinton president, period. Donald Trump is an illegitimate president. He's not an illegitimate president. Damn don't accept Trump as a legitimate president. This wasn't on the level. This election was not on the level. I don't think he's a legitimate president. Our election wasn't legit! He got his victory from cheating. Yes, Trump cheated. Trump cheated the 2016 election. He's an illegitimate president. No validity, no credibility. Mm -hmm. And because of that... Anger at what some see as an illegitimate president. Donald Trump has got to go. It will not be a peaceful change of power. A number of incidents turned violent. Protesters hurled trash cans, flash bombs, and objects at police. Several officers injured. Protesters threw rocks and smashed windows, leading to more confrontations, injuries, and arrests. The chaotic scene just blocks outside the secure area of the inauguration. If denying election results yeah. is extreme now, yeah. Why would so that let's end? let's be really clear. That comparison that you made is just ridiculous. Protests against Donald Trump's election victory wow. surged overnight, and some. Okay. Some became violent. Violence erupted on the streets of Portland during the second straight day of protests over the election of Donald Trump. Some protesters launched fireworks and other projectiles at police. Several people began vandalizing cars. 
Some demonstrators smashed door windows. Protesters faced off with police in other cities, too, including Oakland, Denver, and Minneapolis. Violent protests continuing now for the third day in a row. Some 4,000 angry demonstrators over Trump's election victory taking to the streets. The officers in front of thousands of protesters in what police called a riot. Setting fires, taking their frustrations out on cars and buildings. <laughs> People threw projectiles at officers and damaged property as well. I threw a trash can at them because I'm angry. One woman driving through was attacked as someone used a bat to smash her windshield. They are undermining our democratic process, everything that we stand for. So. Okay, that's it. Bye bye.